uh, the pile of debris that had covered the pit. But the way the ancient Egyptian engineer sealed that pit is incredible. First, they made a, this is the main plateau on which the pyramid and other things exist on the, the Giza plateau. So they made a step right here, and then they built up the, the pit, but about two and a half meters uh, in width, and then piled the wood inside that pit, covered about two thirds of the, uh, of the uh, depth, and then had these very large blocks of limestone, very much like the limestone here, placed on these uh, steps covered the areas between them with uh, gypsum mortar and also the spaces between the blocks and each, uh, and each other with gypsum mortar and the gypsum as it, at, as it uh, cools and dries, the gypsum crystallizes and fills all the holes in between. And that's why most people believe that the, the pits were hermetically sealed. There were two indications for that. First, the fact that the wood, when it was discovered, was almost intact. It had the original sheen on it or shine, or polish, and also the uh, archaeologist that uh, was at the site for the first time when it, they opened the first piece of rock, he smelled cedar from the cedar wood from which the, the, uh, the wooden pieces were made. So with these two indications, people thought that this was hermetically sealed. And from the way the ancient Egyptians engineers designed it, apparently it, it could have been hermetically sealed. That's why we wanted to be exceedingly careful with not mixing the air inside and out during that investigation of uh, ours. You can see now these blocks are from the first pit that was open. It is a very large block. And here is some of that gypsum, gypsum sealer that had the ancient Egyptians had poured between the large blocks so that you'd seal the spaces in between. Uh, the first investigation that we did was to look into the first pit look at all the blocks that had sealed the top of the first pit, study all of its characteristics so that we can figure out how, what to do with the second pit. So we began with an investigation of these blocks with ground penetrating radar, which we have an antenna like the one that is this gentleman in the red shirt is holding. And that antenna sends in radar rays towards the rock. And these rays, parts of them are reflected back at interfaces between one rock type and another, or between one rock and air, or rock, rock and water, whatever the, whatever the case may be. So that we figured out the, the radar penetrability, so to speak, of, or reflectivity of this limestone rock from the uh, pieces of uh, the blocks that were uh, removed from the first pit, so that we can investigate the situation in the, uh, uh, in the second pit. And as you can see, the, the pit is, com is completely covered and concealed by a wall. These two people standing on the left are standing next to a wall where the uh, pit that is carrying, that, that's actually concealing the, uh, the wooden boat is under beneath right here. And this is, on, this is a wall that the ancient Egyptians had placed on top to conceal everything around. So it, now we have the radar antenna right here moving across the, uh, the length of the pit, which is roughly uh, 100 uh, feet, with the radar uh, uh, the image recorder so we could see the reflections from the uh, radar and figure out the depth of the pit, as well as the uh, profile of the contents of this material, because we had planned to uh, drill one or two holes through the uh, cap rock so that we can investigate the interior. After uh, this, uh, we started thinking about the drill itself. And uh, as soon as the Egy Egyptian Antiquities Organization asked me about this uh, situation, I, rem I immediately thought of the Apollo lunar drill. During the Apollo investigations of the moon, we had, uh, through NASA, a, uh, a drill designed and manufactured by Black & Decker Company, right here in uh, Maryland, and uh, so that we could uh, use it to get samples of the lunar materials, and a core sample of the lunar material. And that particular drill had to be completely free of uh, any fluids, no oils, and no gas, because we did not want to contaminate the lunar sample before we, before we, st we look at it. And uh, so we, I went back to uh, Black & Decker to ask them about that kind of drill, because we could not use the same lunar drill. There was only one in existence at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, and uh, for this investigation, we wanted to have two in case something breaks. 
And uh, so I found uh, the one of the engineers that had been a young man when the Apollo program started and had worked on the Apollo lunar drill, and he was still with Black and Decker. So I was very excited about the prospect of working on another drill to do uh, a similar uh, situation. And he did indeed. He designed the drill for us. And he also designed an air lock. That's the uh, thing that you see at the base right there, which is supposed to completely protect the outside environment from that uh, inside during the drilling operation. So this was the critical component of the whole situation. If this is the limestone rock, we have one plate to be attached to it as if it is part of it completely with two O-rings, one of them made of uh, rubber because it's easier to handle, and one of them made of lead separating the two is an area like that. And this lead, uh, lead one is the one that, or this, this one here, is the critical one because it really is around where we're, we're doing the drilling. And lead would have no freons or anything like that that, that may contaminate because the rubber o-rings would contaminate the, uh, the environment inside because of the freons that they have, the, fluoro, uh, the chlorofluorocarbons. And the situation is that if you have the drill or the imaging system or the air sampler, whatever it is that you're doing right here, you are, we can, we can rotate the assembly that fits on top of this plate so that it will either be right on top through the hole so it can do the drilling or it can be rotated such that while we're doing all of this, part of that plate in here would come and completely block this uh, part of the, or the, the main, the, the hole that will go through the rock. And before we do any of the operation, we can remove all of the gases and insert clean air, which we had taken in a, and a canister from, uh, from the mountains of Colorado, even though there is no really clear air, clear, clean air near Denver anymore, but it was cleaned by uh, NOAA people at, uh, at, uh, at Boulder, Colorado. So this was the critical uh, uh, experiment right there, or the, the critical component of the, of the uh, instruments and the stages that we were doing. Now we had to figure out a, uh, an imaging uh, system, a video uh, system, and we did find uh, one that is produced by an English company called the Ries uh, Company Corporation, uh, which is that we found out it is really the highest resolution and the fact that it is the smallest possible one that we can use with low light levels because we did not want to use a great deal of light inside the chamber so we do not affect the temperature inside. And this particular uh, video camera had been used to uh, investigate the interior of uh, nuclear reactors. And that's why it was high resolution and rather small and so on. And it was about uh, nine uh, centimeters in, uh, in diameter. And that controlled the size of the drill hole that we would do. The only thing that we did was to add a fiber optic light so that we don't use regular lights inside the uh, chamber so it would not heat the environment. And so we added a fiber optic light right here where the energy for the light is produced out outside and the on the surface and the light that goes through is uh, what's called cold light so it would not affect it would not raise the temperature inside as we do the imaging with video now the video camera is black and white and the uh, the project was co-sponsored by the National Geographic Society and the National Geographic Society, Society was not about to publish any black and white pictures in the National Geographic magazine. So they had to insist on a still camera to take, uh, to take colored pictures. So we did make, uh, well they did devise one for us, a 35 millimeter still camera that would fit in the same hole and we gave them these specifications uh, so that they will take uh, a, uh, a still camera, uh, still photographs with the color film. And uh, with uh, this in mind, then we were ready for the operation, and that started in uh, uh, a year ago, last October. And uh, so we began with, again, with the, another uh, radar uh, run and began the uh, operation. And one of the things that we had to do was to select a block to do this uh, investigation upon so that we didn't really want a block of rock that may have fractures and because the natural rock is loaded with fractures, so we had to study uh, three or four blocks to select the best one, the, uh, the most structurally sound block, so that any of these micro fractures would not be intensified by the drilling operation and all the things that we're doing. And uh, so we did that, and we finally s settled on the block that we, we, had, uh, we, we would want, we use. And then it was necessary to build a scaffold on top of that uh, block so we can hoist all of the uh, equipment that we have. And the gentleman that was assigned from by the Egyptian Antiquities Organization to help us 
was, was someone who was actually went to that site in 1954 to work on the extraction of the first uh, assembled boat. And he became fascinated by the whole thing and stayed in the area for the, uh, ever since. And he still continues to work for the Egyptian Antiquities Organization there. And uh, he was uh, the man that we took the drawing of the fan fancy drawing of the scaffold that we had taken from, uh, from here. And the more I looked at, uh, this is the gentleman, and uh, Tuhami uh, Ali. And uh, this Trias Tuhami had uh, been the, the man to, in charge of the, of the site operation. And uh, I started explaining to him the scaffolding. And he would look at the drawing and he'd say, and why is this piece here? And they would tell him why it is and this and that. And uh, why, why, why do you have this uh, piece of it right here? And we'd tell him what it is. And after an hour and a half, he would lit cigarettes after cigarettes. And he really wasn't convinced at all. And he said, listen, doc, I have never built scaffolds from drawings. Why don't you just tell me two things? How high do you want it? How heavy do you want it? And let me build you one the way, the way I know how. <laughs> and indeed, from that moment on, it became a joint operation with these uh, people in there. And from nowhere, he would call his assistants, and they would appear from nowhere, carrying the exact, the right pieces of, of wood. And in about an hour and a half, he had a beautiful scaffold that served the whole purpose very well. <laughs> and. Uh, so after we built the scaffold, we had taken a, uh, the flag of the National Geographic Society to hoist it up. And uh, I also, since I am a member of the Explorers Club, I had taken the uh, uh, Explorers flag with me to hoist it up. And as soon as we started unfolding the flags, same Rias Tuhami recognized what we were doing. And he called his son and asked him to fetch other flags, which we found very soon what they were, just to put things in perspective. He had a huge flag of the Egyptian Antiquities Organization and one of Egypt, just to put things in perspective there. <laughs> After we started uh, the operation, uh, people had uh, began to think about the block that we had to uh, drill. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, there, were a, there was started a pool of uh, what we are going to, how deep we're going to have to drill to get through. And guess who won? <laughs> <laughs> So after the, uh, the, the whole thing began, then we, the, the first thing that we had to do was to, com to completely flatten the surface of the rock. And this is Bob Moores, the man from Black & Decker, that uh, had designed the air block uh, for us. And we started leveling off the, uh, the rock and then using epoxy resin. So that, and uh, before, before we really did, we could do that, uh, the leveling. Uh, this Rais Tohami sent for one of his uh, boys because he recognized that we'll spend about two days in trying to level this off with the fancy equipment of Black and Deckers. So he called his, one of his boys with an instrument called ADS, and that instrument, with that instrument, in about 20 minutes, he had the whole surface nearly uh, flat. And the interesting thing is that uh, this particular instrument, you see it today on wall paintings in ancient Egypt and Luxor. And uh, so it is the same kind of instrument. It's probably made of, of different material. The first one may have made of, uh, of rock, and now these are made of, uh, of uh, steel. These instruments have been used in Egypt and continue to be used for perhaps 4,000 years. That is an incredible, really, when you see an instrument like that come from nowhere, and you can see that same kind of instrument on wall paintings that are 4,000 years old. Anyway, he was able to f nearly flatten this up, and then Bob Moores was able to come back and, and really flatten it and then use the epoxy so that we can put the steel plate on top of the rock so that he can mount the air lock on, uh, on top. And as you see, this uh, component right here is the, the assembly where you can put the drill and the imaging and whatever. And this whole upper uh, assembly could be rotated 90 degrees over the uh, steel plate right on the base so that it will either expose the hole or seal it expose the hole to drill through or seal it if we are, if we are changing the equipment that uh, we're using. So now the whole situation is uh, ready. And the, the block was uh, 62 